The future is determined by the past, except for random quantum jumps, which no one can control. Causes have causes have causes, and they go back all the way to the Big Bang. Does that mean we have no free will? People often ask me that. I find the question stunningly uninteresting. Of course we don't have free will. Okay, then how do we make decisions? Do we make decisions? Did the Big Bang make me do this video? That's what we'll talk about today. I already made a video about free will a few years ago, but I've noticed recently that a lot of people think free will is relevant for addressing climate change. And because I don't believe in free will, I've suddenly become a problem. This is complete nonsense. But let's start at the beginning. And we begin, of course, with physics. Everything in the universe is made of 25 particles that, for all we currently know, are not themselves made of any smaller constituents. We collect them in what's called the standard model of particle physics. That's everything in the universe except possibly dark matter, but that's a different story. Most of those particles are unstable and decay very quickly. How can it be that a particle which isn't made of anything can decay? That's a question I get so frequently I made a video about that specifically. For now, let's stick with the particles that are stable. Those are the ones that we are made of. Electrons, up and down quarks and photons and gluons to hold them together. And good thing they're stable because otherwise you'd be more radiant than a nuclear fuel rod. You'd also be dead very quickly. Okay, so humans are one big collection of particles. What the particles do is described by the mathematics of the standard model. It's a lot of maths and you need that maths if you want to answer difficult questions like what's going on in LHC collisions. For simple questions like whether free will exists, we don't need to know much about the maths. Relevant is just that ultimately what you and I do is also described by the standard model. And yes, that means that we know the equations for human behavior. We can write them down. In practice, that's a completely useless statement because we can't solve the equations for all these 10 to the 30 or so particles that humans are made of. Not even the biggest supercomputer in the world could do that. But we don't need to solve the equations to draw conclusions from their properties. For the purposes of this video, the most relevant property of these equations is that they are deterministic, which means that if you know the properties and motions of the particles at one time, you can calculate what happens at any later time. Okay, it isn't quite as simple, because this is quantum physics. So on top of this deterministic behavior, there's an occasional quantum jump, which happens randomly whenever you make a measurement. You all know that I don't believe this stuff with the quantum jumps, but today I'll stick with the most generally accepted theory. So we have particles that behave deterministically, plus random jumps. In quantum mechanics, we use wave functions to describe the particles. And this implies that there are some quantities, like position and momentum, whose values you can't know precisely at the same time. But the wave function still changes deterministically. If you want, you can include gravity, but that's just a deterministic theory, a non-quantum theory or a classical theory, as physicists say. So gravity just adds some more determinism on top. And that's how the universe works, for all we currently know. It's one big wave function that contains all those particles. Its change in time is deterministic with the occasional random jump. The deterministic part is fixed by the past. The random jumps cannot be influenced by anything because that's what it means for them to be random. And that's it. Please don't blame me for this. I swear it wasn't my idea. Physics is great, but it doesn't tell you much about human anatomy, other than possibly that flapping your arms won't make you fly. That's because if you combine many particles, then things get very complicated very quickly. You get new emergent behavior, as it's often called. You don't even need to look at difficult things like human beings to see that. If you do as much as combine atoms to big chunks called metals, you get new behavior, like the ability to conduct electricity, or being very shiny, or being very painful if they fall on your foot. 
Emergent properties don't exist on the level of constituents. They arise from the properties and interactions of the constituents. A single electron doesn't have a conductivity. That just doesn't make sense. Conductivity is a property that only makes sense for large collections of electrons. It doesn't make sense to talk about the conductivity of an electron for the same reason it doesn't make sense to ask whether a single oxygen atom is a gas or what's the merit status of your small intestine. It's what philosophers call a category error. It'd be trying to assign a property to a class to which it doesn't belong. Emergent properties don't make sense on the underlying levels, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Chairs exist, all right, but they exist on the macroscopic level and not on the level of elementary particles. Curiously enough, our universe is organized so that the details of what happens at short distances become less important at large distances. This is why, if you want to understand planetary motion, you don't need to know the population of New York City. This is why, if you want to understand chemical reactions, you don't need to know the standard model of particle physics. And this is why, if you want to become a YouTuber, you don't need to know anything. Physicists call it the decoupling of scales, the mysterious but empirically well-confirmed fact that the details of what goes on at small scales can be disregarded if you're only interested in what happens on large scales. And this is why we have so many disciplines of science, because each discipline of science has its own language about emergent properties that are adequate to its subject. But that we get new emergent properties from the interactions of the constituents doesn't mean the equations that determine the behavior of the constituents do no longer apply. Emergent behavior is a consequence of combining large numbers of particles with complicated interactions. It follows from the underlying laws. It doesn't make them go away. Some philosophers have speculated that large systems could have emergent behaviors which don't follow from the laws of the constituents. This is sometimes called strong emergence, but there is no evidence this happens in the real world. Though there are some mathematical examples. If you have an infinite number of constituents or an infinite number of properties of the constituents or anything else being actually infinite, there are cases where it becomes impossible to calculate one or the other quantity of the entire system. A few examples for this have been constructed in the literature. Usually the proof works by a map to the halting problem or similar examples of computational complexity. However, those are mathematical constructions that have no real-world counterpart because in the real world nothing is ever truly infinite.